This is AutoLine Daily, the show dedicated to enthusiasts of the global automotive industry. Well, it sure looks like the coronavirus is going to have an impact on the global sales of electric vehicles. According to a new report from Bloomberg NEF, countries that are incentivizing electric vehicle sales will see big growth. In China, the EV market is expected to grow to 8% of all sales by 2021, and in Europe, they'll rise to 5% of sales. However, in the U.S., there's weaker support, so EVs will drop to 1.7% of the market in 2021. Combustion engine vehicles will command over 50% of the market for many years to come, but they've already hit their peak. Globally, automakers will not sell more ICE vehicles than they did in 2017. And by 2025, one out of every 10 vehicles sold globally will be electric. The report also said the overall market will feel the effects of the pandemic for a long time to come. It predicts that auto sales will not recover for another five years and that there's going to be a total drop in miles driven through 2023. And speaking of sales, full-size pickups have been outperforming the rest of the market in the U.S., according to J.D. Power. But now it says mid-size pickups are starting to give the big trucks a run for their money. The smaller pickups were 3% ahead of the pre-virus forecast for the week ending May 10th, compared to large trucks, which were down 1%. And for the full month of May, J.D. Power is forecasting that Overall, U.S. sales will decline between 16 and 26 percent based on pre-virus forecasts. But it says sales will get a boost at the end of the month thanks to Memorial Day incentives. We're seeing more and more automakers invest in what they call last-mile solutions and in micro-mobility. And now Skoda, part of the Volkswagen Group, is offering a foldable scooter. It fits right into the spare tire well in the Kamiq and Scala models and weighs less than 5 kilograms or about 11 pounds, but it can carry over 100 kilograms or 220 pounds. The scooter is now available and costs only around $120. Toyota just came out with a couple of big reveals. We'll start with the Sienna minivan, which now only comes as a hybrid. Styling is a little bit more expressive than the outgoing model with a character line that kicks up over the rear wheel well, which helps make the back end look less bulky. And it gets a rear styling element below the taillights that mimics the Supra. The lower section of the front end is similar to the old van, but the grille and headlights have been thinned out. The dashboard is layered with a 9-inch upright touchscreen in its center, and a so-called bridge console that spans the two front seats, which incorporates the armrest and has a good amount of storage below it. But as we know, minivans are not all about the driver. Rear seat passengers will have access to a vacuum cleaner and refrigerator, as well as super long slide second row captain's chairs that can even come with their own ottoman. Powering the new Sienna is a 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine mated to two electric motors, which combine for a total output of 243 horsepower. Toyota estimates the combined fuel economy will be 33 miles to the gallon. All-wheel drive will also be available, but rather than using a transfer case to send power to the rear wheels, Toyota has incorporated an independent electric motor at the rear. Those are the highlights, but if you'd like to learn more, we'll provide a link in the transcript or in the description box below. And sticking with Toyota for the moment, it brought the Venza back. This may look familiar to some of you because it's based on the Harrier, which is sold in Japan, and we highlighted it back in April. Interestingly, the Lexus RX used to be based on the Harrier as well, and you can see a little influence in the grille, which has, of course, a spindle shape. The Venza is powered by the same hybrid setup as the Sienna, a 2.5-liter engine mated to two electric motors up front, but it also comes standard with all-wheel drive, so it gets the third motor in the rear as well. The interior is highlighted by a floating 12.3-inch display screen, which has two polished metal pieces that extend down and anchor it, at least visually, to the center console. The SUV will get a neat feature that we've seen on vehicles from Mercedes, 
self-tinting roof panels. The technology uses electricity to change the opacity of the windows at the touch of a button. And now for something completely different. At a time when all automakers are reporting a big drop in earnings, Subaru is going in the other direction. Its revenue was up about 6% to around $31 billion. It had an operating profit of nearly $2 billion, up a significant 16%, and it generated a net profit of about $1.4 billion, up a solid 8%. Of course, these numbers are for Subaru's latest fiscal year, which, like most Japanese companies, runs from the beginning of March to the end of April, instead of from the beginning of January to the end of December, like most Western companies. I don't know how Japanese companies ended up on a March fiscal, but maybe one of you, our viewers, knows the answer. And now let's look at some of Subaru's latest new models that you probably have not seen before. That's because they come from Subaru's aerospace division. Most people are not even aware that Subaru is involved in aerospace. It recently developed and is manufacturing a new helicopter with Bell and has actually been working with Bell since the 1960s. It also manufactures sections of the Boeing 767, 777, 787, and the 777X. And it's also developing its own unmanned autonomous passenger drone. So how did Subaru ever end up in aerospace? Well, at the end of the Second World War, the United States banned Japan from building any aircraft. So frustrated airplane engineers ended up going into the auto industry instead. Nissan also got involved in aerospace, though. Carlos Ghosn sold off that operation 20 years ago. Mitsubishi still makes commercial passenger jets. And this infatuation with flying machines is a key reason why Honda recently started making private jets. So why are we reporting on all of this? Because at AutoLine, we like showing you all aspects of the automotive industry that you're probably not going to hear about anywhere else. AutoLine Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. We're probably going to see twice as many bankruptcies involving automotive suppliers than we did during the Great Recession. That's the prediction of Paul Eichenberg, who was on AutoLine After Hours last Thursday. And a key reason why we're going to see those bankruptcies has to do with the way that the car companies pay suppliers. Take a look. And then, frankly, what we're in right now is a liquidity crisis that's really Um, as a result of the stop of production for two months, not only uh, here in North America, but you have that in Europe, you have had that in Asia. So as a result, uh, if you think about just the North American supplier, for instance, uh, you've had 60 days of complete shutdown of the industry. And the interesting thing is when everybody starts up next Monday, The significance of that is the OEMs pay on 60 day terms. So basically what you've had in the midst of this crisis is everybody's still getting paid. What happens Monday when the launches restart? Nobody has income for 60 days. And this is the issue that I think is gonna really cascade through the supply base, not just here in North America, but it's happening globally. And what you have is this time frame between Europe and North America basically uh, starting up again as a result of this 60 day shutdown. And the question is, is how do you bridge the gap from uh, really Monday to uh, being able to start collecting receivable again, receivables again from the OEM? How you cover that gap is significant. And be sure to join us for AutoLine After Hours this Thursday when our special guest is going to be the always interesting and usually controversial Ed Niedermeyer. So join me and Gary Vasilash for some of the best insights into what's going on in the automotive industry. And before we go, we thought you'd find this interesting too. 
Alfa Romeo is celebrating its 110th anniversary this year, and as part of the festivities, Alfa launched a new web series called Story Alfa Romeo that details its history. The episodes look at some of the unique stories and people that are part of the brand and feature photos from its archives. There's four episodes out right now, starting with its first vehicle, the 24 HP. And that's it for today's show. Thanks for watching, and please join us again tomorrow.